Good evening, everyone. How are you tonight? How are you tonight? <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, my name is Urs Kasser. I'm with the uh, Berkman Center, and I'm also on the law school faculty here. I have the great pleasure uh, to serve as your MC uh, tonight, and uh, real, uh, uh, really fortunate to welcome you uh, to this special event, to this special evening. Um, as you will see, uh, tonight we will make the impossible possible, or is it actually the other way around, the possible impossible. In any event, uh, I'm really delighted uh, to host the US launch of impossible.com um, and thrilled uh, to welcome Lily Cole, the founder um, of impossible.com uh, and her team here on campus. We'll hear in a minute more about um, this new social network for giving and receiving for free. So uh, it's promising to be a really interesting, exciting evening. Uh, to give you a quick overview of the program, we'll start with an introductory video, relatively short, um, to give us a basic idea of what Impossible is about. Uh, Lily will then add context to that and some background. Uh, we'll have a little demo by her team. Uh, we'll have time for a few uh, quick questions, clarification questions. And we'll then segue into a, a panel uh, with a, a number of wonderful panelists. Uh, I will introduce the panel um, later on. And talk about not only the platform that we're going to launch tonight here in the US, uh, but also more broadly about uh, some of the core issues that the platform raises and broader societal questions around gift economy and sharing and norms of uh, reciprocity and the like. So this will be a, an interesting conversation uh, with the panel, but of course all of you are invited uh, to participate in the question uh, and answer session as well. We have microphones to circulate. I should also say uh, that this evening will be recorded and the video posted to the Berkman uh, website, so be careful what you're saying. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, and um, if you want to tweet about the event, please use the, do you prefer the hashtag impossible or at impossible? At impossible. So that's the way how to tweet about tonight. Um, I think that's all uh, I have to say in terms of housekeeping, right? Anything else? No? Good. Um, with that, uh, again, a very warm welcome, and here is our introductory video. And I'm sorry that the video doesn't uh, play. Um, uh, I really want to introduce you properly, uh, but please, please uh, <laughs> stay here. Um, so Lily Cole is, is as, as you know, uh, a world famous um, fashion model. She's an actress, she's a social entrepreneur. And if I may add to this already impressive list, She's also wicked smart, as you will uh, hear uh, in just a minute. Uh, it's a real gift, actually, to have you here tonight with us. And thanks so much for giving the Berkman community the opportunity to host you and your team. Uh, we're really thrilled um, to participate in, in your latest project, and we're eager uh, to hear all about it. So thanks for being here. I just want to say thank you, first and foremost. Um, I feel very honoured to be here, and I feel very honoured by the brilliant speakers I've got joining us tonight. And um, I'm going to try and explain a little bit about what we're doing, and then I'm going to try and shut up for the rest of the evening and learn from these guys. <laughs> um, so I'll start by saying um, there uh, seems to be, I guess, a, quite a conflict in, in some of the words he uses, like model and actress and social entrepreneur, it would seem, maybe. Um, but interestingly, my background working in fashion, I started working in fashion uh, 12 years ago now, um, led me increasingly to the understanding that uh, I saw economics as one of the most powerful uh, languages that we speak internationally and uh, that has social implications and environmental implications. I was working for different charities over a few years um, and simultaneously working for different companies. 
And I increasingly felt that unless we look at production chains, unless we look at businesses, the ones that you know you might advertise for or that you might buy into, um, we are going to continue to have social environmental issues that then charity will need to mitigate. And so I started channeling my energy into working with companies that you know talked about transparency and tried to you know have socially and environmentally responsible production chains. Founded a company in England on those terms, and um, still to this day try and think through that remit. Um, now that's looking at the monetary prism that we're in for the most part. Um, and then three years ago, I was with a friend, um, had a conversation that gave birth to an idea which uh, preceded my understanding of the gift economy but led me to research the gift economy and learn about alternative economic ideas. And I found the gift economy to be really, really um, fascinating. Um, from my perspective of it, the most fundamental difference um, between the gift economy and what I think predominates today, which is exchange paradigms, is uh, based around reciprocity and the idea that reciprocity might be generalized as opposed to direct. So rather than A gives to B because B gives something back to A, often money could be bartered, could be something in a different kind. Um, what about A gives to B? Trusting that... A, B, uh, firstly, B might need it, and A can, for, for that reason, and trusting that B might give to C, C might give to D, and one day D might give back to A. And if you have a structure or a society or a network or a world where everyone is giving and receiving, inevitably everyone will give and receive, and there will inevitably be a return. It just won't necessarily be direct. And it's very interesting when you think about what the social implications are of that different equation and the research that's been done looking at societies, often pre-capitalist, um, arguably in different measures in our own societies today where the gift economy exists and the social equations that it structures and sets up, the idea that it creates subtle relationships between the individuals. Imagine everybody in this room was there to support you, like if you needed anything, had your back. Like imagine that was everybody in Boston, imagine if that was everybody in the States, imagine if everybody in the world you knew would support you if you needed it, would answer your needs if you needed something answered. And the small price to pay is that where you see the opportunity to help another, you can and you do. Um, I think that's, a, that's the kind of world that I personally would uh, love to feel more of a part of. And so this kind of slightly crazy venture I've been on with Impossible is saying, can we think about that? Like, can we think about... Uh, value and can we think about our relationships with one another, can we propose an idea that we might do things for one another without an obvious sense of return and encourage and facilitate maybe a bit more of that uh, through technology. And so we've built an app and we've built a website which I'll explain a little bit about right now. Um, I'm not here to pitch an app or a website. The more people who join it, the more great that community will be, but really I'm talking about the ideas that are kind of behind it, above it, else outside of it, and it's not, it's not about this one structure. Um, but we've done our best job at thinking about how can technology show up the possibilities so that they can maybe trigger A to help B. Um, because sometimes you don't know B, sometimes you didn't know B actually needed something that you might have or needed some help with something that you could do. So that's, that's the point of this. Um, what we have done is we have created a social network. Um, so like most social networks, you have a profile, which is public and shows your wishes, which are things that can work both ways, so things you can offer up to the community and things that you can ask the community for. So um, it's written in a very free text way, like a tweet, so it's kind of open-ended how people use it. A lot of people have been using it for skills, service, oriented stuff. It could also be advice, it could be products. Um, the only premise is it's, it's all non-monetary. And then um, saying thank you is the thought process behind that was to create an abundant currency. So um, reflect what's happening on the system without potentially quantifying it and making it go into an exchange modality. So you can say thank you as much as you want, and that's always there on your profile in public. Um, so here's in a stream. You can see content that's close to you, so based on location. So you're seeing neighbors' content. You can see people you follow, so existing social graphs. I could follow my people I follow on Twitter, people I follow on Facebook, etc. Um, and we used hashtagging content to um, also, there's no example actually there, but to, to, if I wanted to look up music related content, I could click a hashtag music and find anything posted nearby to do with music. 
Um, we included this one because somebody posted that in Boston yesterday, so I thought it was quite nice. Um, and then here's an example of one being fulfilled. So um, I actually know this man, Ron Garan, he's an astronaut. I wish you could see the picture at the end because it's a picture he took of space, which is quite cool. But um, he posted a wish from Texas to get a girl to go um, uh, to visit Japan, um, who uh, through, I think it was Make-A-Wish Foundation, and um, asked, it ended up being that he needed air miles. A couple of us donated collectively air miles. The girl's wish was fulfilled, and he posted a thank you. Um, and then these are examples of people posting thanks on the network, which again, as I say, is a kind of playful subversion of the idea of currency. It doesn't really mean anything. It just means if you go to someone's profile, you can kind of see all the, all the things that they've done and said thank you for. And then that's uh, a screen grab this morning of a bunch of things that people had posted, mostly in London, because we did the promotion at the end of last year in London, and so most of our community are UK-based. Um, we do have people around the world. Um, and the final thing I'll say, especially before we bring these panelists up, is that when you uh, look at, up the gift economy, one of the examples, interestingly, is the internet and open source technology and how open source software is arguably a, a gift economy of sorts. And I think it's really interesting that, that I, at least how I understand it, the internet's kind of uh, revived, at least in dialogue and in examples, the idea of the gift economy and kind of how, how it can mean, what it can mean for us in a contemporary context. Um, and not only demonstrated it, like I mean, it actively demonstrates it through the, the web itself, <laughs> um, then through platforms like Wikipedia, through um, you know, the GitHub community or Linux community, um, but uh, also shows, I think, the, the accumulative value that we all take from that that actually, by not being closed in silos, we all receive more from that, that by kind of opening and sharing, there is a greater accumulative benefit for everyone. So um, it actually, I would argue, doesn't suggest it's a, that giving becomes selfless. It suggests actually it's a very kind of self-rewarding uh, mechanism. Um, and so, yeah, I think it'd be very interesting to think about the, uh, the broader uh, possibilities that the uh, internet can offer in the landscape of which we are exploring a small, small part of. Great, thank you so much. Now you can say. <laughs> so we have we have time for for some questions. Uh, I talk I very fast. <laughs> there is a question there. Just wondering about what the world. Um, we opened it uh, officially in November, end of November, and I think we're at, we were at 10,000 people at Christmas, and I think at now around 25,000. Um, uh, and it's we're, we call ourselves, in, I mean, we are actively in beta, so we're releasing every month a better version of the app. Um, so I, I don't think its potential is at all maximized. I think we've got a lot of work to do on improving the platform. Uh, we plan also to make it open source later in the year, and. Um, because I know that the ambition is bigger, probably than you know, a small team, of, one small team of people can can do, and I hope that it can, you know, set a precedent that many people can contribute to. I think there was another question. Okay. Sonia, um, can I ask a cynical question about people cheating the system, and ask whether there are some who just take and never give, and whether that's a problem? How you deal with that? I think part of the reason for the thank yous is, um, is being a little bit mindful of that without being cynical. Um, I saw a brilliant economist just before I left. I was at Cambridge University when I was started thinking this through. And just before I left, I saw a very good economist there and um, explained this idea. Uh, at first, interestingly, he, he spent about half an hour just being like, what? He just didn't. And then finally, he clicked and he got it. And he was like, OK, yeah, I get it. I'm sorry. I was thinking in the old way. Um, <laughs> And then he referenced um, sell, he referenced the words uh, way birds fly in a V, um, uh, the way that they structure their pattern and become kind of self-regulating as a system. And um, I think the what we're doing with the thank you is trying to allow some element of self-regulation. So we don't. I, it's really important to me that Impossible doesn't have any kind of omnipotent role that we say this user is bad and this user is good. But we just reflect what's happening in the system so that hopefully the community can manage itself accordingly. So if, for example, somebody is doing loads, which is happening, you know, you have people and there's some very, very proactive users who accumulate tons of thanks and hopefully there is some return. It's not built into the system, 
but of course all the community around them and the people who come to their profile will see that. Um, and you could say arguably vice versa. And if you still want to dialogue with that and you don't think that's a good enough answer, then tell me. <laughs> what type of uh, community standards or restrictions do you impose on your users? In what sense? In terms of what they're allowed to post. What they're allowed to post. Yeah. That's an interesting challenge. Um, we have built tools so that the uh, community can moderate itself, and I think that's optimal. So you can flag and report content. Um, and I think, and I hope over time, uh, we the community will manage itself rather than again us having to play that omnipotent role. We discourage monetary posts because I think it'd be so easy for it to become another place that people and people post you know, sales content. I feel like there's enough, there's enough of that in the world. Um, the point of this is to create a space where that's not the do uh, dominant uh, model. Obviously abusive, anything abusive, illegal, um, we, we um, uh, moderate, yeah. But it's a tricky one, yeah. It's a tricky philosophical conversation around there. There's a question right behind you, thanks. Um, you and your team have really thought a lot about the given economy, but Everybody I've spoken to who wants to make the world a better place also has to talk about the 75% of the global population that's not fortunate enough to have access to, to apps or rich mm -hmm. internet content. Um, there's some talk. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about globalizing a given economy mm -hmm. and how you can transfer goods and services uh, across international boundaries into places where you can't necessarily uh, like ship it. something. We, we start, we're starting off where we're starting off, which is um, Western society for the most part, people who have computers or iPhones. We are thinking already about people who don't have access. Well, the reason we did the website as opposed to just iPhone was it was really important to me that anybody could, not anybody, but a lot more people than just iPhone owners could, could access it. Um, and so that's why we, we built the uh, web simultaneously. We're looking right now, we're doing a hackathon at the end of the month. Um, in Berkeley to look at how we can disseminate wishes in different in ways other than the website and the app. So, for example, uh, we're building there's some a roboticist there has been building an ATM that prints wishes and that could right now it's just like a kind of art, like prototype almost like thought piece art piece. But actually, if it works, we could potentially put in different cities so you get a free point of access where you can find local content. Um, SMS, I think, is really important, and I know our, our partner, uh, Kwame, that's really important to him, is how we can adopt this to work through SMS for um, people who don't have smartphones, obviously, in a lot more developing community, world communities. I'm not suggesting that we can reach the whole world, and as I said, the, I think the idea is bigger than one network will ever probably manage. It's more about, can we... I, I think it'd be great if this became more of a natural practice off the app, you know, just in like day-to-day -day reality. Um, so yeah, we're just dealing with what we can, yeah. Where's the hackathon? In Berkeley. By all means come, it's open. <laughs> there is a gentleman who's really eager to jump in. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to, to add that actually for your 75%, this is less of a problem. This is a 1%, what Lily's addressing is a 1% problem. We're using technology to solve a problem that is about the disconnect between society. Actually, as you go down sort of through, through to the lower echelons, communities exist much more, people support each other much more. Um, and actually, when you get to 75%, you actually find there's an awful lot more giving economy. So it's actually not needed quite so much. It's, it's kind of for you. It's interesting, yeah. I did think that. I thought I wasn't going to go into that space, but <laughs> seeing as you mentioned it, um, yeah, I've actually found, interestingly, on my travels that uh, you've like when I think of examples of seeing the gift economy in practice, I think often of like developing world uh, contexts. Like I was in a village in Ghana where they don't they don't really don't use money. Like it's not common currency. I mean, maybe they use a little bit, but not really. And um, for example, they have mud um, mud huts, and they have to rethatch their roofs every three years. And it's just practice that the whole community will come together, or the whole male community at least, and rethatch one mud hut, and they'll take turns and buy. It's just a given that you have to do that because at one point in the next three years, your roof's going to be need to be done. Um, and also, the uh, conversation that gave birth to the idea was on the way to a refugee camp on the Thai-Burmese border, uh, which I was visiting. And 
once again, that's a really extreme example of, of this, but they don't use money. Um, they live in incredibly difficult circumstances. Obviously, that, that, that refugee camp, when I visited it, had been standing for 26 years already. There had been kids who'd been born there and lived you know, their whole lives there. And uh, they, I have to say, were one of the most amazing kind of communities I've ever been part of because you just see a different value system emerge there. And I'm not trying to romanticize it or say that's ideal, like I think it's a very difficult situation. But you do see, I think, different value propositions emerge and that was, you know, they existed, they were interdependent uh, by necessity through something you might call a gift economy. So um, yeah, you might argue this is actually addressing quite first world problems on, on some level. But. Two questions over there. So, of users in the first world, what are you noticing as cultural differences, say, between people in France and the UK or the US? Have you detected anything? It's really, I think, too, I, I'd love to be able to answer that question. I think it's too early to say. Um, uh, we, all of our promotions have been in the UK at the end of last year. Um, most of our users are in London. We did quite active promotion because it relies on density somewhat. Like it's more valuable if you've got lots of people nearby using it. Um, London's probably been the biggest point of attraction because we did quite a focused uh, campaign there. And then we've got people across the country who I watch like communicate a lot of more of online stuff because they haven't got a strong enough local community. We've got some users in America. We've got some users in um, like Mexico, Jordan, Brazil, Poland. Like you know, because of the way media works nowadays, people have peripherally heard about it in different um, countries, joined early and posted wishes like, I wish there were more users in Mexico. Or <laughs> um, yes, there's been a few of those. Are you finding that the current population of users are exchanging more web-based services or more face-to-face -face services? Uh, again, I think it depends on the location. So in London, there's been a lot more face-to-face -face, uh, and overall speaking, a lot more online because of issues of density. I think that if we achieve what we hope to in terms of you know growing, growing kind of stronger local communities, then that might change that ratio. But yeah, to begin with, um, online. And I imagine also because it's quite an easy point of access, you know, if you kind of want to put your toe in the water with this idea, it's much easier to start giving advice or respond to people through phone or Skype than it might be to actually drive to the house and meet them. Okay, I was, that sort of gets to what I was going to ask, which is how do you balance the desire for you know, locality in uh, giving and receiving things versus the fact that some things don't need to be local. So like if I want, if I want to offer to shovel snow, I probably only want to do that within a 20 minute walking radius. On the other hand, if I was going to offer, you know, help, helping somebody learn HTML, it doesn't matter if they're in Brazil. Yeah. See, that's you a can... New Englander, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, the snow reference is important. <laughs> um, the one question we ask actually when you post a wish is, is it location, is the location um, important? And so if you say yes, then it's shown based on location. So uh, people who are nearby will be shown it preferentially. And if you say no, then the location is treated neutrally by the system. There might be some gradation between like, some things I might want to do within a very short radius and some things a larger radius, but still not the whole world. Yeah, we haven't gotten into the middle territory yet. Yes, <laughs> Jane. What do you think of anonymous gift exchanges? Um, I think they're quite interesting. We're not anonymous. I mean, you could actually be anonymous. Uh, there's no, nothing to stop you from setting up an anonymous profile. Uh, arguably, you'd have less trust in the community because the more kind of, I think the more self-evident you are about yourself and you connect it to other online social uh, networks, probably the more likely people will trust you. I don't know that, but that's my uh, gut feeling. Um, but I have actually can, been considering whether people could post wishes anonymously um, and how then the logic of that would, would work through. I'm not, against, I'm not the, uh, against the idea. You'd obviously run into a problem, practically speaking, if you ever had to meet and issues like that. But fundamentally, I'm not against it. Gentleman right there. In five years from now, where do you want Impossible to be? What will it look like? Possible. <laughs> um, oh, it's always so tough when you talk about the future because then, I don't know, you just feel like you set yourself up for a failure of some sort. Um, obviously, I believe in this. I wouldn't have invested like a large part of three years of my life and as much of my kind of resource and self into it if I didn't. And I really do believe in the value system it's trying to propagate. 
And I would hope that in five years' time, we have either built a community internally or um, if, if through the open source network, we help other people build similar structures that also facilitate that same movement, um, I'd be very happy. Uh, we're also developing separately things looking at monetary, like, like kind of as I began, like the supply chains. I think I have lots of ideas of where this can grow and go to, but um, they're all backed up by um, trying to make essentially deeper connections between uh, people. May I ask a question too? What's the biggest challenge right now or starting an enterprise like this? It's quite, there's quite a few. <laughs> um, uh, fundraising has been very hard. Uh, it's been self-funded by me and our CTO and the British government gave me a grant. Um, but we're structured as a unisocial business. So uh, essentially, we're kind of in another weird gray space where we're not a charity and we're not a business. 100% uh, of profit will go back into the social mission. And so, um, for, you know, it's philosophically largely like a charity, but gives us more freedom to operate like a business and hopefully become self-sustainable and be able to grow. Um, and so that's quite challenging to, like, yeah, it's quite had a few quite interesting conversations with investors about that. <laughs> um, growth, I mean, actually users and uh Solving the density issue I mentioned before is a big issue. So, how can we, how can we grow in a way that it can scale and provide uh, enough value to the users? You know, if you're on there and you love the idea, but you haven't got people nearby on it, like it's not going to return that much value. You know, if you're limited to things you can do online, it's probably not going to return that much value. And I can try my best at flying around the world and talking about it, but it's sort of largely out of my control um, whether we can deal with that that problem as it as it kind of um, emerges. Maybe. So there are a few uh, specific sites like Couchsurfing. There's some, there exist a few sites like Couchsurfing uh, and uh, maybe ride sharing, uh, 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 which, uh, which are just to tap the whole site just to share one particular thing. Yeah. Do you, do you see impossible ending up with sort of, uh, sort of ghettos where people <laughs> Do you end up you, where you end up realizing that actually there's a whole lot of people sharing this one particular thing? We ought to probably uh, sort of create a little market, a special marketplace for particular things. Yes. Uh, do, you th do you think that, you know, that, that could end up into, from being this very generic thing at the moment, end up sort of spinning off uh, places where people, are, you know, the same old customers come repeatedly to, tr to, to, to give away? Uh, and look specific. for specific, very specific things. Yeah, and I think that actually probably would have been a better answer to the five years from now question. Um, we And that is also probably a good answer to the what's one of the biggest problems we have, um, that we're trying to do so much. like that, uh, And I don't think that's wrong, that approach, because as I said, it's more about creating a community and understanding of value at this point. Um, but, you know, there is there's a really great app you might have heard of um, that deals with finding a car immediately when you need one. Um, it's got four letters in it. <laughs> it's really becoming popular. Um, like that's after tens or hundreds of years, you know, maybe not hundreds, but of industries looking at the issue of, of travel and car services and how can we make it more and more intelligent and more and more convenient to the customer. Um, and you get to this, you know, an app that does that very, very, very well. And we're like, how can we do everything that you've all tried to be doing for like hundreds of years at the same time in a different way? And, uh, and of course, the service is not going to be that good. So it would be wonderful if we did have a part of Impossible that was like, can I find a free ride? And it brings me a map and I see anybody who's driving in the direction and I see their profile. So I trust them and it's a more elegant version of hitchhiking. You know, um, it'd be brilliant if we can start to refine this tool to solve specific problems um, in a more tool-like way. But... Uh, that's a little bit beyond our capacity right now. And um, to your point on the couch surfing and all of those couch surfing, interesting. Actually, I read a um, I read a report on these kind of ideas a few years ago that used couch surfing as the only example of non bilateral return. Um, that they've proven that non bilateral return works and can grow. Um, I really love what they do and their kind of philosophy behind it. And I always try to whenever I meet and I've spoken to the one of the founders of Couchsurfing, whenever I try and meet people in that landscape, communicate a very like collaborative philosophy of like, if we can ever help you and like traffic, you know, if we have people asking for homes, 
can we traffic them to you? Like, are there ways we can build bridges between collaborative networks? Um, and I and I hope that uh, many of the people working in that space in different ways will will be as collaborative on the macro scale as they are on the kind of in a micro scale. Because I think that gives yeah the whole idea a lot more hope. Great, I think that's a perfect segue actually into our panel. So I may ask uh, the panelists to uh, join us, but first, thanks again. Thank so we have uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He doesn't really need an introduction anymore. Uh, he in, in, invented the web. What well, can you say more? Um, Tim, welcome. Uh, we have Rosemary uh, Leith. Um, who's a uh, co-director of the World Wide Web Foundation and the Berkman Fellow. We're delighted to have you here tonight. And uh, last, um, no, Jonathan is here, <laughs> great. Uh, we have uh, Judith Donath. She's also a uh, fellow at the Berkman Center and formerly um, at MIT. And straight from teaching, Jonathan, just in time, Hi. our own <laughs> and wonderful Jonathan Citrain. Thanks for being here. So uh, Lily set the stage in, in, in wonderful ways and uh, uh, framed, the, I think, also some of the broader themes that we hope to talk about uh, tonight. And I would actually like to start by taking uh, two steps back. Um, you introduced this notion of, of the gift economy as one of the core concepts uh, that you've been thinking about and uh, you've been inspired by. And so. Uh, in this concept gift economy, we have two prongs, right? One is the gift and then the economy. And in that order, actually, I'd like to start um, this conversation by asking Judith, um, uh, what is a gift uh, as a social practice, as a social phenomenon? OK, so to start with, I think even gift is such a complicated term. And there's a couple of others that have been thrown around here tonight that I think will be useful to clarify. So when we think of gifts, there's actually a bunch of different types of things we can think of. There's the, you know, the traditional Western Christmas gift, birthday gift, and that's a, a slightly different one, but what I would like to say about that one, what's interesting there is that's a lot about saying, what do I think about you? If I'm giving you a gift, it's a way of my signaling what I think of you and what do I think about our relationship. At the more coercive level, it might be what I think you ought to be like and what I think our relationship should be like. The guy who gives his wife you know, a vacuum cleaner for her birthday is giving her some kind of <laughs> message. It may not be welcome, but it's certainly a message. Um, that's you know, a particular type of gift that's about our relationship. There's also the type of gifts I think we've been talking about more tonight, which are gifts within a community, which is another word that I think we might want to focus on a little bit more, because gifts really exist within relationships and they exist within communities. And I think that's one of the big challenges here. I think the gift part, in some ways, is less difficult than the community part. If you look at a lot of the communities that work in this way in which like I give something and then someone else gives something, there's a huge level of trust. And now trust is something that's very hard to gain. And one of the things when you have a strong community with strong ties among people, you have that kind of trust because they've had to do things to prove that they are trustworthy. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done with like with closed communities such as like for instance the orthodox communities of diamond merchants that just you know will have like eighty thousand dollars of diamonds and they'll like toss them to someone else and they don't need to have a receipt or anything but you look at the shared rituals that they have gone through and the years of establishing that they will attend all these rituals they share these norms that they will pay a huge price for either freeloading or behaving in an untrustworthy way, they can afford to be very, very free with giving within that space. And so I think one of the challenges here is that once we move outside the individual relationship with a gift and we start moving into a larger community, the bigger we grow, the harder it is to establish that kind of trust. And so even when you look at online sort of examples of gift giving. One, a little gift, I think some of the examples have been very interesting on Impossible. I mean, people say, you know, asking, like, they just want the answer to a question. 
But if you look at the internet, there's most of the internet. If someone asked a question, there was like Usenet was people asking questions. They wanted an answer. Quora, they're all over. There's a lot of information that's out there on the web because people have been asking and answering questions there for a long time. And those answers are a little bit of a gift. And if you look at things like the history of Usenet, while it wasn't a bounded community, it was a community. People got to know each other. They were in small groups. Once the web came around and there started to be search and the community boundaries started to break up, that sort of lightweight gift community, lightweight as it was, fell apart because then you would have what were effectively freeloaders coming in because they came in through search as opposed to become coming in as community members and they would like ask a question, get their answer and off they went. So there wasn't the sense that you were an answering something to someone who would then contribute. So while this doesn't quite answer your question of what is a gift, a lot of it is that it's things that we exchange to maintain and establish these relationships and it's done within the boundaries of some kind of relationship and community. So it's very helpful as a framing. Yeah. Um, one quick question as a follow up. Yeah. Um, are there gifts with negative value? You alluded to it. It's not it's not clear that it's always positive. But. Well there's tons. I mean is there anyone in this room who has ever received a gift that they did not like? Who that's never happened to? Right? It's regifting. Um, yes, there's regift. Well, regifting is, is great. That's in a community where you often get it where it's just you always have to bring that bottle of wine to dinner, and there's that bottle of wine nobody ever wants to drink, and it can move around the community. But there you get a lot of that. That's the thought that counts. But a lot of them can be there are coercive gifts. The gift that says, This is the sort of person I think you are, and you think, I, I'm not that, or the sort of the, the inappropriate gift from someone you're not that fond of, who suddenly gives you like you know a great necklace. It's like, um, you know, I really don't think we had that kind of relationship. But thank you very much. Perhaps you would like to reconsider that. So yeah, there's certainly a lot of it is because they are costly statements about what someone thinks you're like, what they want you to think of themselves, and what they want to think about your relationship. So you certainly, those are all, a lot of the cost, especially in personal gifts, is that um, you're very likely to make a mistake. And that, I think, is also just one quick thing here, where, again, there's a lot of different types of gifts. And so that type of gift is something where what the recipient wants is a big mystery. And how good you are at guessing it, or how oblivious you are, is a lot of the message in it. But we're looking at it on something like impossible is very different. It's where people are very clear. I want this. I want this. Here are the things I would like. If you want to give me a gift, here's the gift you can give me. So part of it is the, it doesn't have that kind of costly giving of some kind of information showing what you know of that person. You don't reveal anything about your acumen, about who the other person is, because they've already told you what you want. So that's also a different type. So the part of the question is, when do you want to be able to say, I'm going to give you a gift because I'm going to show you my insight. If I know what you want, I can't communicate any personal insight. Fascinating. So, so one of the key takeaways from what uh, you're describing so helpfully is that gifts are um, a deeply social practice mm -hmm. um, and, and have a long history, obviously. Um, so. When we segue from the gifts part uh, to the gift economy part, I'm wondering how the emergence of, of markets uh, uh, have actually changed our culture of giving and receiving. And I was hoping, Rosemary, that you could share uh, some of your observations. Of course, you already heard, right, that um, nowadays we have business models um, that are built um, around sharing practices and around things that um, previously were actually all about giving and receiving for free, and now it's commercialized. So what does the economy, uh, the market economy in particular, do to our culture of sharing and, and giving? Well, I think if you look at capitalism a little bit in the market economy with profit motives, perhaps um, accumulation of wealth, um, in the digital world, what does that mean? Um, and is it fed by social capital, really? Um, you know, what is social capital? It's getting access, it's increasing networks, <clears throat> excuse me, increasing your quality of life as a result. <clears throat> is it self-interest? 
um, which is slightly contrary to what Impossible seeks to do. But can people use uh, use the site for self-interest to build their social capital? Um, and is building social capital selfish if you're fulfilling a wish? What do you think, Lily? Um, I interestingly actually have drawn an analogy previously in my mind between uh, the social reputation that was recognized often in gift economies that, uh, yeah, a lot of anthropological texts again have, have written about um, that there is social reputation is a big part of the practice and um, how social media depends largely on social reputation, I would say, and as, um, that's a big kind of um, a big force behind it. And I don't necessarily think that that's a bad, I don't judge it as good or bad. You know, I think that people have different motivations for, for giving, for cooperating. And sometimes I think obviously it's beautiful when it's done anonymously and there isn't self-interest. But I think that if you cooperate and you give because there's an element of social reputation in that, if it ends up with a more cooperative world, like I'm not going to hate on it or judge it or stop it. So, but I do think there is a very interesting, um, yeah, analogy there. So, uh, I would say one, sorry, one yeah, last thought there. And if you actually think about, I think if you think that through, um, like what, uh, what does social reputation mean? It means that I walk into a room, you know, like a real room or a theoretical room like my Facebook page, and it changes how people relate to me. You know, it's how I'm perceived. And um, you might say that social reputation could be built on power or could be built on showing off. And that's what I'd say a lot of social media does right now of like making your life look amazing. Um, you don't see that many posts, you know, pictures on Instagram of like, here's how a crappy day. <laughs> um, uh, if your social reputation is built on, um, is built on your acts of kindness and like how you interact with the world around you and your community, like that's quite an interesting inversion of, of um, social reputation and I don't think it's necessarily a bad one I know that I have um, wonderful like I feel like mo like many places I go in the world I have wonderful people around me and wonderful friendships and that's probably largely built through my relationships to them you know and how hopefully I've treated them and they've treated me and that grows in time um, so I think somehow you can remove the cynicism um, from it and see that actually it's just uh, of value maybe to everyone to, to interact in that way, yourself included. So I would like to drill down a bit on, on this question, what's the role of technology? And obviously with uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee here, um, you, you gave the world a wonderful gift with the World Wide Web uh, protocol uh, and basically created a, uh, something that now itself is a platform uh, for, for uh, giving and receiving. So the question is, um, is the internet in its DNA and the World Wide Web in particular uh, bolstering social norms of sharing and, uh, and, and this kind of mechanism that we now also see um, uh, uh, underlying impossible.com? Or is it uh, about the humans using the technology? So what's, what's the role of technology in the world? I think it, well, it, it's true that yes, for the people who were playing in the engineering task force designing protocols back uh, back in the day, so the people that, that that I sort of looked to and copied, they when they designed the previous protocols like TCP and FTP and SMTP, the things that came before HTTP, uh, they none of they, those were all communal things. So the, the the commons was how it worked. That was it's, and it's a bit like the commons of scientific knowledge, uh, you know, that, that you establish. The, it's a very well-worn way of working that you establish. You, everybody raises the commons, and you do that when you're developing internet protocols and when you're developing knowledge, and then you, you can spin things off on top of it, and you can use use the platform. Uh, so yes, initially, you could the, the development of the platform itself was very much done with a mo commons model. But once the platform is there, then it can be. It's supposed to be a neutral platform. It's supposed to be just. It's supposed to be like a white sheet of paper. It's supposed to be used for whatever humanity uses it for. And so uh, when you look at the web, you see humanity, and you don't necessarily see a, a commons model. Yes, I noticed there's a John Perry Barlow quote on the wall. Uh, basically, uh, I, I forget which exactly of his words, but obviously you can see just from that quote that, that he, he, he was saying, you know, we're building this place where it's all going to be different, and, ever, and, uh, and uh, he, he was expecting something very utopian. 
he stands out, I think, as the peak of all no, oh, He's maybe selected for the quote on the wall as being the person who really represents that. Nobody else really went for such a utopian idea. Some people still feel no on the web because you can contact copy, copy stuff. There should be no copyright, for example. But most people, mostly what you see on the web is no, you see humanity with its commercial and with its altruistic and with, with all the things that you see. So, in, so I don't think the web itself... Um, uh, sort of is naturally trained because it's a neutral platform it doesn't naturally work better for altruistic things that said it gives us a choice of what we build on top and so if we are thoughtful and when we build the next platforms if we do things like think about what sort of world we want to have instead of just uh, implementing the previous world in bits if we actually think and hey you know and say hey it would be nice to have a world in which things were different then I think we can. So, so it gives us a chance to start again. The things we build on top of the web can be whatever we want. So I think sort of more power to impossible for, for, for deciding to go deliberately in a way, not because the web takes you that way, because Lily decided it would be good to go that way. It was actually on that point, it was really interesting. I'd been working on Impossible um, very much by myself at this point a few years ago, and um, I'd just done... Uh, I just done the first version of wireframes. Finally, after hiring two people to make them, and they were not right, I was like, "How am I going to do this by myself? I don't know how to use uh, PowerPoint properly." And so I was like, "I'm going to make them by collage." And so I just made collage wireframes, scanned them in, and mocked together how this thing was going to work through ten pages. And my um, old history politics teacher um, came by, now retired, like one of the most brilliant wise men I've, I've been uh, fortunate enough to be taught by. And um, came by for a cup of tea, and I showed him, I just want to show you this thing I'm working on. And it was quite extraordinary to see. He was um, like genuinely blown away, and not by uh, the singular idea of, of um, I don't, yeah, well, that was, was called impossible at that point, of impossible, but rather by suddenly seeing what the internet can potentially allow us to do. And he studied history, like he studied hundreds of years of different social movements and different political movements. And I think he just suddenly saw, oh, things that people have been trying to do, or societies have trying trying to do for hundreds of years, now actually may be possible. In, and what does that mean? Not impossible by itself, but what does that mean broadly? Um, and I, I personally have been very, very inspired the last few years through working on this and just thinking about the breadth of possibility there is um, for uh, for new things to emerge. I mean, if you think about social media and how I don't, I don't think there's another example historically where the whole, like such a huge proportion of the world has so quickly changed its social dynamic in a very, you know, in a very immediate way. Um, it's, it's pretty powerful. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. And it's really in its infancy. So I'm, I'm very interested to see what other ideas people have and, yeah, what else we can do. I thought you we were going to say he was, and he looked over your shoulder and said, Lily, give us to me our code of JavaScript for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he knows what JavaScript is. No. <laughs> um, so and I also think you're, uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, but the Web You Want campaign, which I know you two are working on, um, really speaks to that too. It's like the internet is so amazing and it's like we have so much potential with it and I think it's so important we honor that. Perhaps we can get back to that in just a Sorry. minute. I'm get um, because that seems to be a terrific segue actually for something that Jonathan has uh, been thinking uh, a lot about, and that is this question, the generative quality of the internet, but also very much uh, going forward, um, uh, the pressures that exist and, and uh, the threat that exists to an open internet that allows uh, for uh, things to be built on top um, in the way as we've seen it in the past. So looking at the status quo and, and, and perhaps more interestingly, some of the trends you see happening right now in, in commercial world, but also how platforms are actually operating, um, in what direction are we headed and what are some of the possible implications, not only for platforms such as impossible.com, but for the ecosystem, how we uh, as, as users um, participate in, in interactions, in sharing, uh, and in social practices? Well, I think you're right to ask about the pressures on the platform and on the platforms and also maybe to draw within that the pressures on individuals these days. Um, we live in a time where we have more affordances, to use a nice social science term, surely than ever before. The idea that we can get a message or a photo or something out to the world and if it's interested in it, it will ricochet instantly. 
it's been easier to do in 2014 than 2013 than 2005 than going all the way back. And at the same time, I think it's fair to say that our perception of the environment is one where dangers lurk at every corner. Somebody's like, oh, you opened your computer. That was your mistake. Uh, it's totally compromised now. You'll have to microwave it. And <laughs> you're like, what? <laughs> yep, yep, it's gone. Um, or uh, the idea that if you cross the wrong person online, like your life can become a living hell as subscriptions are ordered up for you and calumnies are said <laughs> about you and you're left having to fill out repeated bubble sheets on Facebook that this does violate the terms of service and no, I don't want to send them a message that says they're a bad person. Can you take care of it? Um, and the normal response to those kinds of fear and pressure is to an individual to, to withdraw, to pull in. I think to a parent to tell their kid, like, you're not going online except for me watching you and maybe an angry bird or two until you're 27. Um, and I think also to try to look in the first instance for protection in rules and in specially designated security entities that will help you. And there's reason for that. I mean, we are in a law school, so most of the writings on the wall outside are about how great law is. Barlow <laughs> oh, is the sorry. one standing out. You, <laughs> Tim, you went right to the one that was most relevant. Where Barlow was like, screw this. Um, <laughs> The, the it's from the Declaration of Independence for Cyberspace, which opens with, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come to you uh, from the home of cyberspace, the place of mind. Your old states have no purchase here, but I digress. Um, that was very 1996, that sentiment. And uh, as we find more rules channeling us, either through those who would review what we do for acceptability, uh, automated rules that uh, may categorize or limit what we can do. I think as with rules and security in the offline world, there's a longer term cost, even if they're working well for the shorter term problems, in that more and more when we behave in certain ways, we can't tell ourselves, we can't answer the question, am I doing this because I'm a decent person, or am I doing this because Dr. Skinner will deliver a shock if I should stray? And when the rules are enforced that well, we no longer internalize them and own them. We simply do it because that's what we'd better do. And I get pretty nervous about that. So um, anytime we've seen online an act, the gift that was referred to by Tim of not looking to patent what he did just in case. If it should hit big, then maybe I should, you know, get 1%. Is 1% too much to ask for the web? <laughs> I'm glad I'm not giving you this advice then, but only now in retrospect when it's too late to uh, do anything about it. Um, when we see those acts, those are moments of inspiration that do inspire stuff, and I can see it collectively too with something like Wikipedia. And we can ask how much social capital matters on Wikipedia. There are barn stars you can be awarded and statistics of how many changes you've made. It's just funny that the barn stars have no security to them. It's not like only if five distinct people vote that you have earned a barn star, may you get the barn star, and here are the rules for evoking it. It's anybody can edit your user page on Wikipedia to paste a gif of a barn star <laughs> in it. Be like, good job. And which makes you realize that you could go to your own user page on Wikipedia and award yourself every known barn star and invent a few more the way that a uh, dictator might uh, give himself a stooning of medals for imaginary accomplishments. And people tend not to do it precisely because there's not a rule against doing it. It's just no fun <laughs> to vote yourself rich that way. And I think that's a pretty genius piece of the design of Wikipedia. So uh, what I like about something like Wikipedia and about Impossible is there's a weird silver lining in a world full of trolls in which we can choose to break the trolls' rules and damn the consequences and like be nice to one another in measurable ways that we own. And the less of it there is, the more we're obviously owning it when we're choosing to deviate from either the transactional 
or the transgressive first order against rules norm. Um, and there's one other thing I wanted to say about social capital, which is it is a platform, but it's one infused with a very special priming of the pump. And I think that when people uh, encounter a measure of fame and celebrity, what that means is there are other people who are like, I'm really excited about what you do. I'd like to somehow be a part of it, just like kind of get a piece of the magic. It's called fandom. And I think when people are subject to fandom, they often choose to become ambassador for UNICEF, or they pick a cause. It's like, if you have some extra energy to burn off that's called liking me, why not give money to this good cause? It seems like a really nice <laughs> idea to channel just the 56th like of you into something useful for someone else. And I think the genius, Lily, of what you're doing is instead of just picking your cause, you've built a platform and told people like, don't even follow me in my particular thing of like abandoned pets, although everybody should help an abandoned pet. <laughs> <laughs> this message sponsored by the MSPCA. Um, <laughs> but instead saying, pick a way in which you'd like to be nice to a stranger and connect with them and own that. And by doing that, you will honor whatever good feelings you have about me. That's what I'm asking you to do. And I think that infuses this otherwise neutral platform with a certain starting spirit that it can then exist independently and go off in the directions it goes. And I think the web is that as well. There's so much connection in the sense of building a platform and giving it that boost. And finally, the threat comes in either um, from somebody wanting to troll it, and I think we could probably learn a lot from Wikipedia on the way in which it deals with trolls, which is genuinely amazing. It's with a form of fake love that just totally frustrates them, where like they vandalize a page, and a good Wikipedian will then deal with the vandalism by reverting it and leaving a note on their thing that says, we're so excited that you like Wikipedia, that you're playing around with it. Here's a place where you might also try that won't hurt the page as much. And like, damn it, I was trying to hurt it. And like, thank you again for your interest in Wikipedia. And they like really have to try to get a rise out of the Wikipedia administration such as it is. And how do you know? How do you know what? That that's what happens to trolls. <laughs> <laughs> It's all research, damn it. It's all research. It's for the greater good. Um, I've seen it happen. I, I, I've read about it. Um, yes, that's the answer. Um, and the other thing is you can become a victim of your own success. That if something becomes too popular too quickly, and exactly what makes it successful and therefore popular is the culture and practice built around it, rather than a particular magic technology that just you push a button and you get a magic bean, if too many people flow in looking for the magic, we get what I think is what anybody who has been to Burning Man says the next year that person is at Burning Man, which is, it's gone to hell. That last year was the key year, and everybody who joined after me is just a hanger on. And, and you know that from YouTube. I, yes, that's right, that's right. So figuring out how to deal with the influx of attention that comes from success and retaining your spirit, I think that's a problem Wikipedia faces every day. It's a problem the web faced when people, for a while, when they looked at trolling of various kinds online, said, we need new computer ethics. How do we keep training people? In we are past computer ethics at this point uh, as the main way to solve it. But despite that, I do think there are ways to try to help onboard this new energy that comes in. So they're really apprenticing to the very spirit that made it successful and made them want to join to begin, it, uh, to begin with. Jay-Z, do you think yes. that there's um, a movement to crowdsource kindness? So if you have a young generation of people who grew up on the internet, that instead of going to soup kitchens, you can actually go online and you can be kind online. You can find an outlet, as you're saying, for, um, for a number of things you want to do. I mean, look at Reddit, Reddit yes. Gift, for yes. example. And so actually, it could be the start of something really magical, of a new trend, of, of uh, a new vehicle for people um, instead of physically going out. I do, and I think the less formulaic it is, 
the better, which means one might have to continually evolve modalities of finding people in need, of being kind. And, and uh, Reddit, in that particular subreddit, is an incredible example mm -hmm. of just transforming Absolutely. people's worlds. Now, when they make the reality show based on it that then follows people right. around as they are awarded, yeah. it all starts to get transactional and such. Mm -hmm. But I think the hope is that that spirit then finds another uh, pathway to express. And I think it's a habit that then becomes learned. It's really, it's so amazing when you go to your first meetup or you successfully have a couch surfing and you define success the first time as like no one died, no one was killed. And then you're like, did I have a good time is actually the new success. Um, these are things that really can change people's, I think, general outlook on life. And that's to me why it's so powerful. So maybe we should ask how the Wikipedians would deal with a with a troll anti troll methods with a, with somebody who puts dark uh, dark uniformed anonymous forces in a neighboring country uh, just to see what <laughs> see uh, without very much comment. Uh huh. Maybe that maybe it's a form of it's a form of trolling, and it would be susceptible to the same so, sort of treatment. I think that certainly the. It's the ethos of nonviolent resistance to yes. almost anything, mm. which is, I'm not going to play in your frame. And that may mean that I will pay a great cost. And it's not clear that every threat can be met successfully mm. with nonviolent resistance. But my guess is we are underestimating that number rather than overestimating it. Great. This may be a, an excellent moment uh, to open it up. Uh, uh, since we have some Wikipedians in the audience, uh, wink, wink, uh, in case SJ wants to weigh in uh, with reflections. But any questions to the panelists? And wait for the microphone, please. It's right here. Uh, it's um, funny, I hear a birthday yes. next door. Wouldn't it be funny <laughs> if we yes, all yes, sang yes, happy yes, birthday yes. right now? <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa. Um, I'm curious, with the gift economy and sort of these social bonds and, and sort of these social networks building up around sort of reciprocity and, and sort of spontaneous, so to speak, giving, is, are there concerns that we end up giving to people that we relate to more often and that this can stratify us and sort of make us say, hey, this person looks like me or thinks like me or listens to the same music and, and then we have got even more sort of segregated or stratified society because of we say, oh, this is all good and gifting, but actually we're just sort of kind of creating a smaller pool of tighter connections. So it's the gift yes. bubble issue. Um, I I don't think I could ever answer that on like a on a base like human level of like the instincts we might have to give to one another, um, but on a systems level of like how we've designed impossible, um, I tried to design it in a way that uh, would allow serendipity in the content you see. So that's why you don't just see follow, you don't just follow your friends. You know you you, you know you you kind of your stream has local content. Uh, it's taking the best know, features of chat roulette yeah. and putting them into Impossible. <laughs> I, I think there's a, another way of looking at it is that you don't want to try and build interfaces that go contrary to what we understand about human nature. And it's true that people are more trusting of those who look similar to them. There was, um, there was a very interesting experiment done a couple of years ago by someone who was looking at um, who you will vote for. And it turns out if you combine, that they could say, OK, these people wanted to vote for you know, Bush, and these people wanted to vote for Gore. But if they took the person's own face and very subtly combined it with the candidate's face, it actually quite changed the level to which you vote for. Huh. So there's all kinds of things that basically, if you could find someone out there who is you, <laughs> you'll just give them everything. I love okay? social science. Which That's probably <laughs> makes a lot of um, a lot of sense. We are, you know, we have a lot of reasons to want to give to family, et cetera. So what you want to do when you design an interface then is you say, let's work with this because it also turns out that we can redefine the different coalitions that um, we see as people like us. So if you want to work on that design, you say, okay, well, what we don't want is to say, you know, all the white people only give things to white people and, you know, et cetera, like that. You say, what are different ways of setting up how groups are formed in this piece? You know, there's been other experiments done um, 
where people have taken groups and said, you know, basically, you know, that's the way it works, how sports works. You put a green t-shirt on one set of people, a yellow t-shirt on another set, and they're like deadly enemies. And so you could do things like that in interfaces that say, okay, we're going to make this particular set and say you are like these people. You can do a lot of things to work with that kind of tendency as opposed to saying we want to go against the tendency to give to people like us. You can just start to think about redefining how do we want to do that. And I think that that also, there's a, I think there's a very complicated thing in English is doesn't seem to be doing a good job with words around gift mm -hmm. because there's so many things packed into it. But the kind of gift that's about a relationship like with an immediate person is very different than the gift that's a charity. And you know, I think one of the things I'm still struggling to understand about impossible is where does it fall in that domain of the gift that's about the personal relationship and the gift that's a charitable donation to somebody. And charity is a lot about giving to others. And you know, if you read something like Maimonides' work, a lot of it is about saying that the giver should be as anonymous and disappear, and that the highest level is where people don't even know they've received something. And so that's very, very different than the kind of gift exchange that's about, it can't be anonymous, because it's all about building a relationship. So I think as we develop these interfaces, we need to kind of understand which piece of you know, the traditions and understandings of gifts and relationships we're pulling from. So, yes, a local church, for example, would have a, a t two phenomena might be, one might be a potluck supper where everybody comes and brings, you know, gives random food to each other on a very much of a peer level, and then they're also twinned with a church somewhere in, uh, in the school, somewhere in, in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa where they're building the school. And it's a sort of completely different relationship. But it does seem that when you're if you're trying to get somebody to go and do the, 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 the second giving where you're crossing community boundaries, you're crossing, I think one of the early questions was about, yes, but you know, isn't this just about the 1% learning to give when the other 70% already give and that's the only way they survive? But it is true, isn't it true also that even, that even though there might be this theory of the gift being remote, if you want somebody to give, you make them con very conscious of exactly what the little girl they're giving to looks like, even though they're you know, way the other side of the world. In fact, what you do, instead of saying, you're going to give right. to people of this, you know, in this country who have right. been in fam fam famine, you say, for the cost of a coffee, you could right. inject this child with their, with their vaccines. Right. So just, just for clarity, like Maimonides' notion about gifting as, as charity, the highest level wasn't that you don't know who you're giving it to, but they yeah. do not know. Who gave to them, and they do not, and at the highest level, they don't even know that something was given to them. Like you know, something just appeared, and their life was better. But they're not even aware that someone has come to help them out, because the idea was that there's something that that can be deeply distressing about being given to. Also, so I think part of it is there's such a complicated, there's very complicated psychologies around giving and receiving and, and the issues around reciprocity are a lot of, a lot of it isn't a bad thing, it's about maintaining the dignity of the recipient mm -hmm. to be a giver. Um, yeah, uh, I actually think that one of the interesting insights I've come to through this process is that, and I could be wrong on this because it's just speculative, but, but that people actually have a harder time receiving often than giving, mm -hmm. and that actually at some point I wanted to call this the receiving economy <laughs> almost. Um, and said, I just call it the giving receiving economy. And it's interesting that actually it's very, I've never, I don't really ever see those two words put together. It's always kind of the gift economy or the giving culture. Um, and of course, they're both necessary and important. Um, but is the receiving and, the asking? Or just being willing to receive or like being vulnerable enough to, to let yourself um, and to potentially question the idea that that disempowers you, you know? And I think then you get into an interesting dialogue around the power politics of exchange. And does there have to be, um, you know, Marcel Mauss that we were talking about previously wrote about the power dynamics that come into gift giving and that it can uh, create subjugated power relationships. But that, does that have to be the way, the way it is? Or is that because we're used to an exchange paradigm where if someone gives to me, I therefore expect I need to re return to them? Um, it's in, I don't know. It's, it's, in, it's interesting psychology. But to your question on what types of uh, gifts, uh, one I would love to do in future and, and like build more anon anonymity um, option, uh, aspects as we touched on earlier and we're trying to think through that now. Um, 
partially for those reasons. And secondarily, it's the emphasis is on peer-to-peer -peer giving, um, not so much charity giving, but we don't, um, like the man who wished, for example, for a little girl to go to Japan was obviously, it was his choice to make a wish for somebody not himself through a charity. I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to stop that or chastise that, but generally it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Right, yeah, I didn't necessarily mean that it had to be that a charity was like to an organization, but just the paradigm of a gift that's Seeming about, charitable. Right, there's a difference between the gift that I, you give to someone because it's about expressing something about your relationship and the gift you give to them because you think you're in need and I'm giving this to you to, because you need help. To be honest, I would love if we just got away at some point from even the language of giving and receiving altogether um, because it, I, I, I kind of feel like you're inevitably receiving when you give and vice versa. Like I actually don't see them as that compartmentalized. And, um, and so I wouldn't see it as charitable necessarily, but just as like a normal, natural human thing to do. And then these other normal, natural human beings around you are also going to do that back. And, <laughs> and that just feels a bit more normative. And um, that for some kinds of uh, ways in which this unfolds, I'm, as you said, out of words to use it without saying gift, um, <laughs> that in some ways, like, I, we have to give Maimonides a break. He was writing a long time ago, and it was before the internet, I think. Um, and for the Reddit example that Rosemary brought up, uh, do people remember the bus monitor? Her name was Karen, I forget her last name, who was bullied terribly. That video went online. The trolls had a decent time with it. And then Reddit saw to it, not only that she was given like a pat on the back and some support and a little bit of money. But I think it was ultimately around $800,000 that she was given by the crowd. And I think the only way to understand that is collectively people wanted to make a statement that said $800,000 says that's not the way you should behave. It's not a statement about punishment. It's a statement about just how much of an outpouring there was, five or ten dollars at a time, about their view on it. And the fact that it wasn't, maybe the givers were largely anonymous, but that the whole thing happened was meant to create a statement about who lots of people wanted to be and what society they wanted to see. And that's a neat function. I like the idea that it's more about, I, I hear Lily using wish more than need, because a wish is something beyond need, but also less necessary. It's like, you don't, I'm not telling you, you have to give this to me. You'll be a bad person if you don't. That's a need, I think. A wish is, look, you don't have to do this, but it would really be cool if this happened. Don't you agree too? Yeah. And when it does happen, I agree, great fortune. Like chance has smiled on me rather than just, I got what I was due because people should have what they need. It's a very different yeah, it's like a non feel to it. But and, some, wishes yeah. are, some wishes are offers, yeah. if I'm right, and some wishes are asks. Yeah. So it's, it's actually a, a Which a was double. interesting, actually, because we started off with um, the wish being divided into I wish and I can, and had people kind of in a more uh, polarized way posting things. And we actually discovered, to my delight, that people were using I wish to post offers, too. So saying, like, I wish I could help do da-da-da-da, or I wish I could da da, -da. Um, Which I just think is wonderful, because it's... It kind <laughs> I of could really use a dollar or two would be the other one, too. <laughs> yeah. Submerging the two, you know, which is what yeah. we're talking about, submerging this idea of giving and receiving, which is a bit crazy, but I think... You know, we do actually, I think, receive when we give. And when we break that thought paradigm, I think there's something very powerful that could happen. We have a few more people. You have a mic already, right? No? So uh, the concept of impossible is really fascinating to me. I think it's something that's very closely tied to language, um, especially because we access the ability to understand and comprehend the world through language. And so it, language defines what's possible. And it's also the means in which we could kind of chart new cartographies for what can be possible if it's currently not possible. And Emilio Rory talks a lot about this in terms of uh, relationship between power and, and, um, and imagination. And so she talks about how poets are often the most powerful people in the world because they have the ability to imagine new relationships, um, especially in the context of like social movements, for example. And it seems that we're kind of moving away from, or we're not moving away, but we're moving towards 
the power of technology and the language of technology as a new way to imagine and solve impossible problems at this huge scale because not only is it uh, the internet and the web as a as a uh, as a system is very large. It's you know you're no longer thinking within your local sphere, but you're thinking at a global level. But the language itself allows you to manifest into this plane something that you know, language can always can't always express. So when you create something with code, you're building something, and it's a way to kind of reimagine relationships and re um, and build new things to kind of solve large problems. And so I'm kind of curious, you know, uh, Tim and Jonathan, what your thoughts are on how the language of technology and the language of the internet, you know, whether it's HTML or any sort of programming language can kind of help us conceive and tackle large problems. And then Lily, what your thoughts are maybe on how your platform um, is a way for us to articulate impossible problems in new, new ways so that they can be solved. Tim, you want to start? Language, I'm not sure, so leaving, yes, language is, Whatever thoughts and concepts we have and ideas we have, they, they, until we've communicated them with, with words, then they're not actually, sort of, they don't have, really, have, have any effect. So we get this interesting one. You imagine that when you look at some of the language somebody's using, that, that you're sort of, it's the only model we've got of what's going on in their brain, even though their brain may be thinking, I have lots of wonderful and much clearer ideas. Uh, what you get is the results of language. What's, so what's interesting, um, so in, Twitter, for example, it's what's fascinating, the way people have developed their own language. People develop their own language all the time. You know, kids develop language quickly uh, and until uh, they develop their own sort of teen language, until it's written up in a book that the parents can buy and then they immediately switch it with, uh, to another teen language uh, so that so sort of people will change the language to define groups and things that to, in order to stop other people sort of yeah, being impinging on the group. But otherwise, it's uh, often, yeah, throughout history that new words have, you know, have been created when there have when been new concepts. It's rather neat the way things happen. Uh, we're on Twitter, not doing a retweet, modified tweet, and all kinds of little acronyms get, uh, people get put together very quickly because people come up with a, um, because in fact there's new things going on and people just invent things that ways of talking about it. It would be of course neat if in uh, I don't know how you could make that happen in impossible. If so the, you know, so, that's, so if the so the imps for example new word we started, yeah, that we yesterday made that, we made that word up. Say, somebody what well, somebody wished somebody. I wished I wished that I wished that impossible users were called imps. Yeah, and then it and got on. Then, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Um, I suppose that happens a lot. Maybe the word gift. So maybe what you, you can do is end up sort of retracting some of the words from the website, which take some of the words out of the code and leave people, you know, leave just leave uh, a, lot of artwork, a lot of art and some buttons and let people in, start inventing new language. We so should that do they that, don't actually. Have to, Someone so tries they don't to have swear, to say I wish. Cover flowers. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe they'll, uh, maybe they'll end up you know, finding ways of saying, I, uh, they won't say I wish or I want or I need. They'll end up producing new words, which actually go to some way of addressing your, you know, your issues you have with, with these ones we've got at the moment. I love, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a geek for um, language and um, playing with words. And we've actually got, uh, in the app, we've spelt wishful and thankful wrong with double L's. And we had a couple of people comment, hey, you've spelt wishful and thankful wrong. And I'd be like, no, actually, <laughs> that's on purpose. Make you think. <laughs> yeah, it's just, a, it's full, <laughs> sense of fullness. Um, yeah, to your point on impossible, uh, my uh, uh, thesis in university was called Impossible Utopias. And I was looking, it wasn't related to the gift economy, but I was kind of trying to uh, reclaim a concept of utopia in a post postmodern landscape and um, looked a lot at the idea of how we frame possibility and uh, impos impossibility. And that I would argue that are largely the idea of the impossible is largely a human uh, construct. And um, so challenging essentially what we consider impossible. And I guess that is a bigger vision of what impossible is about. Uh, so actually, I say that one of the things I've noticed with we've done lots of interviews for the Web We Want campaign, asking people to think about the Web they want, and it's staggering how they assume that whatever we have, we have in 15 years' time 
is going to have the DMCA just as it is, and computers are going to be just like they are, and all the, you know, all the software is going to be pretty much, they're going to say, yes, you know, they're, they're assuming operating in a very small space. They're not, think that, um, so yeah, the, 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 these assumptions that, that, uh, the, the, the existing vocabulary we've got uh, the existing words we've got to describe space are will be the ones we have to use in the future is really dangerous. So we should uh, make sure it keeps us inside the box. Yeah. Please. So, Lily, to your, to your thought, uh, to what you said about getting more about, about helping somebody, um, I'm, I'm reminded of this sort of Buddhist statement where um, when you beg, you're actually giving people the opportunity to make merit by helping you. And so, um, and sort of that, have you thought about in the user interface um, giving people a chance to describe how they've been fulfilled by helping others instead of just saying thanks about the people who've been helped? Um, that how they feel about helping. Yeah, in other words, their experience of being fulfilled. Yeah, we have actually. And um, uh, storytelling, like encouraging storytelling, something we're working on now so we get that to come more to the surface. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, there's like a long list of things that we're trying to build in, but that is high on the priority list. And I think hopefully actually will go in this month. Yeah, because I had just in the last few months, the magic for me is hearing people's stories. You know, and hearing how people have made this connection or had this experience. And I just hear trickles of it, you know, people who reach out to me or I meet. Um, and I think it'd be really lovely to hear more of that and collectively hear more about that. Thank you. Hi. I've never tweeted, I've never been on Facebook, um, and I'm not a Buddhist, but I am begging for a sip of water. I'm looking at your water, thank Aww. you. <laughs> Thanks very much. We can arrange for you to tweet as well tonight. <laughs> Could be the exacta. Thanks. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. There was a question I just add something very quickly too about, um, I can't remember who asked it, um, about homogeneity, is that the right word, of making sure that people don't only give to, the, to people who, who are like. And I just want to say very quickly, last time I was in this room was for um, Ethan Zuckerberg's book launch, Rewire, and, and uh, Rewired, and he was talking about exactly that concept and how um, there's a real danger to the internet being designed in a way that potentially you just see, you know, you should go to these bars because your friends like these bars. You should read these books because you already like that book. And um, and I, I genuinely actually do think there's a real danger in that in a lot of algorithms architecting how we experience the web in a way that reflects our own experience, previous experiences or biases or friendships. Um, and with Impossible, I've avoided... <laughs> if anyone else wants water, I'm not drinking it. So. Um, thank you. Um, For sale to the highest bidder. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, for Impossible, it's something I've been mindful of of um, make of trying to make it serendipitous. So with crowdsourcing serendipity, um, a man in this room actually helped come up with that idea of how we could create matches that that we crowdsource rather than algorithmically do for that reason entirely. Um, and I think there's a bigger issue there about how if I go to my computer and I'm seeing mirrors of sorts in my experience of it that I think there's a very big philosophical danger to that. The filter bubble. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm. The advertising filters, the whatever they are. So we have time for one last question well, I'll make before it we good. have to wrap up. Uh, so much of the conversation tonight has centered around social capital. And Sir Tim had mentioned uh, couch surfing. And, and you, you, you lend out your couch with the hope that you can use somebody else's. And Jonathan had mentioned Wikipedia and the way that you, you can clearly see a user's contribution. So Lily, when you were dis, um, kind of designing this impossible, uh, to what extent did it play in that we could kind of keep tabs on and how many wishes somebody's you know, uh, fulfilled or, or just kind of keeping score or as it seems the way that you would rather use wish than gift, uh, resisting that temptation? We do, that's what the thanks does. So that's an acknowledgement to that point somewhat. Um, and so that reflects what people are doing on the system and is always public. So you do get a sense of what people are doing. Um, does, there's nothing in Impossible that says that's good or bad or therefore you know, you're more likely to get your wish fulfilled. It's just transparent. But I would say that with, um, I don't think it's as simple as, I mean, there might be people who, do, who, who game in that way and try and earn thanks to receive, but I don't think that that's very likely. Um, and even with uh, couch surfing, 
uh, the way I first came across Couchsurfing was I was doing a film in Montreal and one of the actresses told me about this site, Couchsurfing, she was using, that her and her boyfriend used and they had they had really high ratings on Couchsurfing and so therefore they had about 20 people a week who would request to stay in their house and they would go through their profiles and when they found somebody they thought it was interesting and they'd get along with, they'd invite them into their home and the only reason they would do it is not because they were banking on getting a couch the next time they were travelling but because they genuinely enjoyed the experience that offered of meeting somebody they would never normally meet, having a conversation, taking them around the city. And it was like a real social exercise. Um, and so I think that, once again, the kind of, the value actually in, uh, that you receive in giving, giving, you know, of like experiencing that human being and spending some time with them and having that moment in time is actually really valuable. And I think that Impossible will only work and be successful if it has that, if it, if it delivers on that. Because it's the only real reason that people will continue to be part of it, not to earn a photograph that says thank you. <laughs> but the threads of the two lives for a moment, the gift, are, yeah. are just twisted yeah. for a moment, and then they drift away, and that's very rich. And that moment in time, like yes. in that, yeah, which is all we really have, you know, it's like time, and it's like, let's enjoy it. <laughs> which also helps the surfer understand that it's not a free hotel. It's like there's actually part of the culture of it where maybe it's doing the dishes or pulling out your lyre and playing a nice tune. I guess that's more of Maimonides thing. The duty of no, the, more, of, of the guest is to entertain the traveler thing those, that you were yeah. expected to participate. So I think, you know, I think again, I think we tend to subsume a lot of these things as being, you know, all this is sharing economy or something. They're all very interesting, but I think they're interesting in really different ways. So I think this issue with, with couch surfing really is about saying, here's a way, and I think this is very much what you're getting at a lot with Impossible, of saying that we're sort of a brokerage where one particular set of needs and one set of abilities can come together and then people can have this experience where they share some time and they can get to meet and that the matching of the, the wish and the granting of it is sort of the catalyst for having a shared experience. Um, and that's, I think, what couch surfing works as is that kind of catalyst. I like think Wikipedia is, a very, is also really interesting. It's a very different model. And I think there we might want to look at more like craft traditions, that there's something that people have about the pride of building something, that you, know, that you make these pages. And even if you're somewhat of an anonymous crafts person within it, you know, there's buildings that have gone up like this. So there's something about being part of a group that creates something and seeing that here's this creation that I've been part of and I've contributed to it. It's also... It's also a selfless act compared to going to the store and buying something for, as a monetary exchange, but the psychology of it is, is not better or worse. It's just very different than the social couch surfing piece. Great, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap up here, um, and I'd like to end by asking each of you, what's your wish for impossible? <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> and I feel like I'm in one of those movies where you get one wish and then you try to put a technicality in it and then it comes back to haunt you or I guess it's the monkey's paw, isn't it? Um, so not that. Um, my wish is for it to surprise us all with just how powerful it can be. Like I do think the ingredients are lined up very nicely and it is one of these generative ideas that is ambitious but not wholly planned, that's ready to turn on a dime or a pence and try something else, and uh, that it surprises us several orders of magnitude on where it can go and becomes the thing that poor Wikipedia has had to be for how many years now, where every time you wanna light a flame of hope that things can be different than just transactional or security, you're like, but Wikipedia! And people are like, yeah, 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 Wikipedia. But, so uh, there'll be that moment where somebody will be like, but it's impossible. And what they don't mean is, of course, it's not possible, but like, what about impossible? They do it. You're like, well, now there's only two examples. You know, that's double the number of examples. Exactly. And Kelsey. Great. Judy? 
That's a hard one to follow. <laughs> so we're like, I wish all the good things possible would happen to it. Um, all right, and now I have to say something different. Um, so I will, I will take a subset of that and just say, you know, I wish that it emerges out of it something really fresh and new that is unexpected. And I think that it's hard to say what that is. But you know something that makes us think there's a, a way that people can work together through this medium that we just hadn't foreseen. Now that we see it, it makes sense, but we just hadn't known that, and that it works as that, the catalyst to make that happen. I, I wish uh, for you to all go home and wish on Impossible and uh, make it a viral, make a viral impact in the U.S. and America, and start a global movement. So it could start here. So that's what I wish for. I've been down from the road, of course. I have to ask uh, to wish that Impossible should have a meta wish, which allow them to use as many have as many as wishes want, as they yes. all want. <laughs> but uh, but <laughs> in danger of, of Impossible then blowing up in smoke, lack of contradiction and level breaking. Uh, I'll settle for uh, I will I will settle for a uh, a wish that Impossible will manage to blend somehow. The, the sort of uh, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, giving between people of similar similar stature, similar place, and know each other uh, pretty well, with a continual stream of giving from those who feel that they have to those that feel that they don't have, uh, in a way that uh, hope, in a way that maybe people don't really notice that that, that 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 flow is happening, but in the way that also there can be the sort of giving which can adjust inequality can come out of it, as well as the one which is celebrate, you know, which is which happens between peers. Lily, concluding thoughts. What do you wish um, I, I also wish for surprise, like some of you said. I mean, I've got like, you know, like my dream scenario of, of growing a community and different value systems and what are the implications of that. And if we do turn into business and make money, like all the awesome things socially, environmentally, we could do with that money, you know, like I've got the normal, like the normal stuff. But I think actually, truthfully, like if it surprises me and it just... It kind of goes beyond my. I, this is premised on like my faith and optimism in people, and if it surprises me how wonderful people can be, um, that would yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you very much. So uh, it's become clear you've given a lot tonight, um, and one uh, thing I learned: it's not about uh, only about giving; it's also about uh, receiving. Uh, and therefore, I have a few small gifts uh, to say thank you to all of you for. Um, this great panel and uh, everybody an applause, gets a car. Please, so. yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. Oh, these are so colorful. Uh, obviously, I get a blue or green one. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>